we've made two mistakes. We have marketed health as a commodity that can only be achieved through treating symptoms. Yes. And we have lost. We may look different and live in different countries, yet our stories are knitted with the same threads of excitement, uncertainties, challenges, and victories. As we journey through the ups and downs of life, it is our undeniable will and God's strength that propel us to joy after pain, smile after frowns, and ups after downs. We were born to win. We were destined to greatness. We are overcomers. Welcome to God's Scoops, Raw and Unedited Stories. Welcome to Raw and Unedited Stories the place where stories are told to uplift, encourage, and brighten your day. With us today is Dr. Andre Williams, an award-winning in integrative oncologist. He's here to tell his story. Welcome, Dr. Andre Williams, to Raw and Unedited Stories on God Scoop. Thank How you. are you today? I'm doing well, Pat. Thank you so much for having me and greetings to all your listeners. Yes, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for your time. Oh, no now, problem. Tell our audience where you're from. So I'm from the best country in the world. I think you know where that is. It's beautiful Jamaica, West Indies. And I live in Montego. Well, I work in Montego Bay, lived in Montego Bay for the past maybe, how long now? Well, 10 years. Um, originally from Kingston, moved here to do work, which I guess we're going to talk about in a little bit. But um, I wouldn't live anywhere else, to be honest. <laughs> That's awesome. I love to hear that. Dr. Yeah. Williams, what is your story? Yeah, so my story is about stepping out in faith um, in my career with God, oftentimes just with God alone. <laughs> and allowing myself to be exposed to new aspects of what the human body is capable of um, that you probably wouldn't learn readily from a textbook. But you know, God is the author of all wisdom. He's a source of all wisdom. And so I've been on a um, almost 10 year journey now of learning to walk with him, even when my academic training in many cases tells me to go in a certain direction. I've had to learn how to listen to his voice above even my own professional training. Awesome, awesome. So talk to us about uh, this uh, journey and how you have helped many, many people who have suffered yeah. from cancer and other diseases. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so the story begins with, first of all, me being in medical school at a young age and um, doing, having completed medical school in 2005, uh, the usual chain of events is after you've graduated, you go through a one-year internship. And then having done your internship, you would then try and find a way to get into what we call a postgraduate or residency program. And, you know, even from that age, I could see God closing certain doors and opening others. So, for example, during that internship year, you know, halfway through the year, I still was adamant that I was going to become the greatest surgeon <laughs> ever. Right. Um, but somehow something changed. Um, I had a, a, a supervising doctor, what we call in your country, they call it an attending physician. In my country, it's a consultant. And um, he was, he happened to be a cancer specialist. And so I worked with him for three months. And I was just somehow drawn to being able to help cancer patients in that way. I saw how much even the smallest gesture and the smallest um, amount of pain relief meant to these patients. And I kind of shifted gears a bit and I said, hey, you know, I kind of feel like this is what I'd like to do. I prayed about it and I heard God saying, send in an application right now <laughs> to do your residency. Yes. Um, so against all the odds, I sent in my application at that time to say, this is what I'd like to do. And it turns out that in that year, two things happened. One, I was the only applicant for that residency program. Wow. So it was almost a shoe in for me to get in. And also in, during that year, the government decided to change their regulations for um, interns of that year. And that meant that we'd have to do an additional year 
of supervised, um, it was essentially a supervised internship. Um, but when the time came for us to start that additional year, because I had already been accepted into that residency program, um, I pretty much just avoided doing that second year. I went straight into, into residency and in a way I got, I ended up leapfrogging ahead of my peers, my cohort of that year and mm -hmm. ended up being a resident while they were still, <laughs> still interns. Um, so, it, you know, I saw God moving in my life from that early stage of my career. Um, if we fast forward about uh, five, six years afterwards, um, here I am now completing my residency program and I was offered a post here in Montego Bay, which meant that I'd have to leave Kingston, move to Montego Bay. I was married at the time and my wife still had her job in Kingston. And again, I had to trust God and say, all right, I'm going to take up this job offer in Montego Bay. We'll try and make it work. Um, and find a way to, to make the quote-unquote long-distance relationship work. Mm -hmm. um, so I took up a job at Cornell Regional Hospital here in Montego Bay. And, you know, this is a point in your life where you feel like you've more or less reached the summit of what your, your career is supposed to look like. You're, you're sitting at the end of the journey, and now all you have to do is to build on, you know, establishing your professional reputation, treat as many patients as possible, set up a private office and that kind of a thing. And, you know, the rest is going to be history. You know, I was mm -hmm. 30, 33, 32 years old at the time, pretty young. And, you know, a, a doctor's career can last to as long as 75. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was no need for me to do anything crazy at this point. But this is when God started to speak a little bit more loudly in my life. Um, I started to notice that uh, some of the patients who, well, most of the patients this side of the island were not interested in doing chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and so here I am, fresh out of postgraduate training with all of this vast world-class knowledge, feeling like, okay, I'm going to make a difference here in Jamaica. I'm going to offer the best possible care to these um, quote-unquote underprivileged <laughs> patients this side mm -hmm. of the island. And the first, maybe four out of every 10 patients said to me, I'm sorry, I'm not taking that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not putting that into my body. Um, yes. and, and so at first I said, well, I'll treat the other six out of 10 patients. That's not too bad. Um, and slowly, you know, I started to feel, you know, this is not really what I signed up for. In my heart, I wanted to help people. And I didn't feel comfortable just helping six out of 10 patients and the other four just kind of fell by the wayside because I then had nothing to offer them. Um, eventually, I started to notice something else that bothered me, which is that out of those four patients, some of them were actually getting better on their own without me. Um, and that's when, you know, things, you know, Moses had that burning bush moment where yes. he's yeah. <laughs> minding his yeah. own business, mm -hmm. uh, has not a care in the world, quite content to be a shepherd. And then something kind of shifts and he has to pay attention. Um, I remember one particular patient with stage four Hodgkin's disease. He had already uh, received all the possible chemotherapy and radiation he could. And I remember sitting in the office with him saying, sir, um, I'm sorry, but there's nothing more that we can offer you. Your disease has not responded. And um, there's, I don't have any other chemo to offer you. And he just looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, I'm going to be fine, doc. And I, yes. said, I said, yeah, okay, you're, yeah, we're, yeah, I'm sure you're going to be fine, but um, please check in with me every three months just so I can track your progress. The first three-month appointment he came back for, I noticed he looked healthier. Right. <laughs> I looked at his blood results and they looked a little better. And I said, well, okay, this could happen. Um, he came back again three months later, the blood results were even better and he was even looking stronger. A lot of his pain had resolved. I said, okay, that's a little weird. Then he came back three months later. So this is a total of nine months since I told him I had nothing to offer. Right. And he came in looking quite strong. He said he was doing gardening and everything on his own. Wow. Um, and I, I said, sorry, guess what? I'm going to lock the door to this office and you're not going to leave until you tell me what you've been doing. Um, and that's when I started to realize that what we've done, 
we've made two mistakes as as um, as a population of the world. One, we have we have marketed health as a commodity that can only be achieved through um, maybe very careful. Yes. Through let's put it this way: through treating symptoms. Yes. And we have lost sight of the fact that God is the one who made our bodies. And he made our bodies to be able to regulate, um, regulate themselves. So our body was built to regulate itself. And when we have this ease, it's essentially when we, our bodies encounter something that it's unable to respond to adequately. Mm-hmm. And what we have done over the years, whether deliberately or not, is that we've started to try and force the body into a state of regulation rather than finding out what was causing it to struggle to begin with. Mm -hmm. So a classic example is if you're having a headache, the first thing we've been trained to do subconsciously is to grab a headache pill, a pain Mm -hmm. reliever. And so, yes, we relieve the pain, but guess what? We never found out why was the pain there. And so the obstacle that the body was facing was never really addressed. And here we are, maybe two days, two months, two years later, now facing either the similar problem or another. And so what that has done now, it has created, unfortunately, two really vast opposing factions in the world of health. There's on one hand, you have the people who say that all medication is bad and you should avoid it. On the other hand, you have people who say, well, you know, herbal medications are are horrible and they're not carefully researched and so you should avoid them and neither side has been talking to the other now when i spoke to this gentleman in my office and he told me what he had been doing he revealed to me that he had been using a